Hey everyone, Ponyo here. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of After Dinner Mints. I highly encourage everyone tuning in to join us in the Artbox Discord. A link to our Discord can be found in the description of this video. As always, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss an episode of our weekly show. And now I want to introduce our guest for this afternoon. We have generative artist, Jacob Gold. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks so much, Jacob, for being on After Dinner Mints. Uh, yeah, looking forward to chatting with you. But yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I'd love for you to kind of kick things off by telling us a little bit about your background. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I went to uh, college and I studied physics and computer science there. And I also got involved in academic research, uh, doing a lot of work uh, related to physics, specifically biophysics. And I then went to do a PhD in mathematics, but continuing to do my research in biophysics, uh, studying properties of living systems. And I graduated last year, 2021. And after I graduated, that was when I learned about NFTs and art blocks and generative art, sort of all at the same time. And I saw the work that other generative artists were making. And I was like, hey, I've been programming for like 10 years now in my research and in my spare time and I want to take a crack at it and I uh, love doing it. And so now I'm doing that full time. Very cool. Uh, we always love to see artists, you know, kind of pursuing their, their dream full time. So it's very cool to share. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, when you were getting into generative art or just art in general, were there any artists that you looked up to or that kind of inspired your work early on? Yeah, definitely. Uh, certainly starting out, I was specifically looking at other generative artists. And uh, a couple of them that really stood out to me were uh, Manolo Gamboa. And I really like his vibrant colors. And I also like the way that a lot of his work uses like multiple distinct elements in it. And it Oftentimes when I'm making generative art, like I start off just thinking about like, what is one idea that I can explore really thoroughly, but it feels like a much more complete work if you start uh, putting together like multiple distinct things that feel like they work together. And also Zach Lieberman is another generative artist to look up. There's the print on the wall behind me. Yeah. Um, and I love his use of color as well. And also the way that he uh, finds so many different uh, ways to explore the same ideas. And I think that's something I try to take into my practice is uh, there's basically no limit to how many different ways I can experiment with the same system that I've been working on. Uh, and then, and you yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, you go ahead and finish. Oh, sure. Uh, the, more recently, I've been like learning more about just other forms of art, and I feel like the abstract expressionists have a lot uh, of ideas that are relevant to making generative art. Uh, one aspect of their work is that uh, trying to represent like the subconscious or to do things. Uh, whatever feels natural as you're making the work. And I feel like that's very relevant to generative art because you basically have to describe to the computer what is it that feels natural about the work that you're making. So it's like in the process of making generative art, you're making your subconscious uh, ideas about what is appealing in art. You're making those conscious as you translate them to the computer. And so uh, I really like the works of Helen Frankenthaler and uh, some of the later stuff of Jackson Pollock. Awesome. That's great. And I'm curious to know, you mentioned, you know, when you were getting into programming, you kind of learned about uh, NFTs and, and art blocks. Uh, what, what was your introduction into this space? Was there like a specific person or maybe an artist that got into it that kind of inspired you? Yeah. So for learning about NFTs, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, in the Coquina pre-drop talk but I was watching Hot Ones and uh, uh, Paris Hilton was a guest and she was talking about 
the new NFT that she was dropping. And I think I'd heard about maybe in a couple other places as well, some podcasts I listened to. But that was what prompted me to spend some more time looking into what these things are because I'd sort of been a casual fan of art in general up until then. So I was like, this is what's new in the art world. I wanted to see what it's about. So I found my way onto OpenSea and I was just looking at one of the top collections on there. And uh, Art Blocks was one that I clicked on and it stood out as having a very distinct point of view from other NFTs at the time. And then I learned more about what the gender of art was behind it. And I learned that some of the things that uh, I had actually encountered earlier on in my uh, studies were more relevant than I had initially thought to generative art. Awesome. And I'm, I'm kind of curious, actually, when you learned about, you know, the NFTs and you started like looking at it a little bit more, did it instantly click or did it take, you know, some time to kind of make sense? Uh, I think that it clicked the most when I understood how art blocks worked, because the idea of taking the work itself and putting it on the blockchain in the form of the code used to generate it, that's like, this is a permanent way to preserve these works. And so that's why I love releasing my work on art blocks is because it has that uh, extra assurance that it's going to be around for a long time. Awesome. And, and can we see actually some of your early, you know, generative art pieces? Yeah. Uh, actually, let me pull one up real quick. I forgot to do that one ahead of time. Uh, so my first work was on uh, Tezos, on Hicketnunk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that if you were to look at my stuff now, whether it would be uh, easy to find your way to it. But I've got that open here. Oh, I do not. One sec. Okay, so this is my first work uh, on Hicketnunk. And the idea is I have this system for drawing these concentric shapes. Uh, and as you move across the grid, uh, you change the parameters of that system. And it ended up generating these forms that reminded me kind of of insects in like a shadow box. And I was just very eager that I had made something that was appealing to me and I really wanted to share it. I don't think anyone I knew ended up actually buying any of them, but uh, this will continue to live on. And then a little bit after that, I made a generative version sort of inspired by uh, Schwembelder's works on Hicketnunk. So here's an interactive version where you can click it and it will regenerate a new form each time. And That's so, cool. Is it, is it like a new iteration each, every, each and every single time it would never repeat? Is that kind of the idea behind that one? Yeah, sensibly. Uh, obviously, there is not as much variety as some of my later projects, but the idea is that each time you get a new shape. And I'm kind of curious, like, how did you decide which piece to mint first? Because, w like, when you kind of decided, all right, I want to put something on the blockchain, was it something where it was more of just, like, an exploration? Or did you have, like, already projects and pieces in mind to kind of put out there? Yeah, uh, this is not, this is, this might be the second project that I ever, like, coded up. Um, I think the first one is not something that I didn't finish, but had originally intended for art blocks. And so I wanted a lot more variation. This was something where I felt like the piece was complete. Uh, like it fully explored the parameter space for what this system was able to do, but uh, it sort of had its own limits. So I felt happy putting it as something that was accessible on Hicketnunk. Great. Can you talk this also a little bit about your academic research and, and how it relates to your work? Yeah. So uh, in my undergrad, a lot of my work 
uh, or a lot of my studies were on evolutionary algorithms, which is uh, kind of a way of doing optimization problems. Like if, today, when you think about like machine learning, you're using like a neural network and you give it some input and it tries to learn how to produce the correct output. Uh, another approach you can use uh, to that kind of problem is an evolutionary algorithm where you sort of generate random solutions to your problem and then you give them sort of a fitness score based on how close they are to the solutions that you actually want to produce. And then you recombine elements of the fittest solutions like DNA recombining. And uh, there's this scientist, Carl Sims, who his work was one that I found really intriguing, uh, who took this kind of approach to uh, develop these sort of creature-like systems. So it's basically these are creatures which are evaluated by how much they can move as they swim through a fluid simulation. And they're just made up of blocks that or have some sort of like piston type connection between them so they can wiggle back and forth. And then uh, he did the same thing for creatures moving across land. And this was something I found really interesting at the time as a scientist, but only later on did I learn that Carl Sims actually went on and is now like working full time as an artist himself. And he has like exhibitions where uh, he'll have like a, set of displays set up with pads in front of them that can tell when someone is standing on them and whatever elements people are more interested by because they stand on them longer, it'll reuse that in the artworks to regenerate new artworks later on. So little did I realize I was learning about generative art at the same time as I was doing scientific research. That's super cool. That's awesome. And, and what was the name of the artist again? Carl Sims? Carl Sims, yeah. Got it. Very cool. Um, I would love to talk about your project, your first project on Artblox uh, called Coquina. Is that how you yeah. pronounce it? Mm -hmm. uh, so this was released in November of 2021. Um, yeah. Would you kind of kick things off by just telling us, you know, the idea and concept behind the project? Yeah. So the concept was I was doing some experiments. Uh, my process in general is I usually start out with an idea for an algorithm that I think will produce some kind of interesting visual output. And so when I started out with Coquina, I was playing around with flow fields and I was able to generate uh, these really interesting organic shapes that uh, are the shapes that you see in Coquina that sort of gather together to create a larger arrangement. And so I knew right away that these shapes were just inherently appealing to me, uh, but I didn't quite know what it was that they represented. So I just continued working on it, uh, seeing what kinds of parameters that I could change and what direction I could push it in. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized that these sort of resemble like organisms of some kind, uh, but they're not moving. So maybe these are like shells under the ocean. And coquina is a type of uh, sedimentary rock that's formed of shells compressed together. And so I thought that name just really captured the shapes that I was working with. Awesome. And, and how'd you go about, and actually, if you don't mind showing a couple of the mints, maybe uh, you can tell us a little bit about, you know, selecting and naming the color palettes for this project. Yeah, uh, so I had some mints here. I don't have all the palettes represented, but here is, uh, this is the original color palette that I came up with. And it was really just a result of pushing myself to use more color in my work in general. And like the idea behind this one was I wanted something that was essentially a rainbow of colors, but didn't feel like the standard rainbow. And so just through a lot of trial and error, I was able to come up with this palette. 
And in every other palette in the project, uh, it randomly chooses one of the colors of the background. But for this one, uh, I found it always looked the best when it has like a more neutral background to let the bright colors pop more. Um, yeah, so this is my starting place. And it might be uh, the one that I feel the most happy about because it's it stuck with me the longest. Um, but then as I continue to develop uh, the shell idea, this one sort of came about uh, like what is a undersea color palette that would capture that idea. And so I have these blues and oranges and then this color palette here is more of like a tropical feel with these bright greens and pinks. And so I just sort of use that concept to carry through uh, like a visiting a tropical location kind of vibe. And how did you select on, or how did you kind of go about the figuring out like the shaping for this project as far as, I see obviously a lot of, you know, circles on the outside, but obviously like the main focus is, especially for this specific mint right here is, you know, it seems like a lot of layers involved. Like how do you go about um, kind of coding that and, and, and deciding on, you know, what that'll look like? Yeah, so that is actually an algorithm that I've used in basically all of the work that I've released, uh, at least in like the past year. And it's basically the system that I came up with for generating an interesting set of points. And so uh, here I can click and it'll regenerate another one. Basically, I just wanted to see how can I make these shapes look distinct from one another. And so the way this works is I start out with a set of random points, and then I construct uh, points in x, y, and z, and then I construct three random functions for how to map uh, from one x, y, z point to another one. And so I map those points a couple times. And so even though each of these shapes starts out with a totally random set of points, once I map them several times, they start to take on all these distinct structures. And so also the size of the circles in these images represents the Z coordinate of the point. So you can see that. Uh, and so basically this system is, is like the data that underlies all of my mints. And then with each project, I have a different way of interpreting that system. So this one, for example, if I was to find, that's a good comparison. Something like this is a shape that might be pretty familiar in Coquina, like these kind of sinusoidal shapes, uh, or the one I was just showing you, this big triangle here. And so the idea is uh, once I have that set of points, I sort of construct a region around them, and any of the shapes that fall into that region, I make them quite large, and any of the shapes that fall outside that region, I make them quite small. And so the result is that you can get like a huge amount of variety in what kinds of uh, arrangements these larger ships can take. Very cool. And I'm curious to know as far as uh, how you prefer the, the art to be displayed for this project. I could imagine, you know, this being, you know, beautiful being printed. Is that something um, you have a, you know, strong opinion on or are you offering prints or would you prefer it to be, you know, displayed digitally or, or some other method? Yeah, I would love to work with uh, collectors who are interested on prints. Uh, I haven't done any prints for Coquina, but if anyone wanted to reach out to me, I'd be happy to do so. Uh, and I do think that for Coquina, there is an animated portion where uh, each of these shapes are added one by one to the canvas. That is more of a approach to dealing with the fact that it takes up to like 30 or 45 seconds to generate the whole image. And I don't want someone to just stare at a blank screen, but I do feel like for this project, at least the finished composition is like the point of the art. Awesome. And I'm interested also to kind of see like, what are, are there any mints from this project that kind of surprised you or do you have any like personal favorites that you like to share? Yeah, so those are the ones that have been 
scrolling through here. Um, there are two kind of variations in coquina. There's uh, some of the mints have a extra flow field applied to them, like this one, which has these shapes flowing inwards. And there's also uh, these shapes that uh, look more like some kind of microscopic organism than a cell. Uh, and when you get those two combined, this is the only mint where that happened, then they actually end up having like this uh, kind of leafy foliage shape that I really liked. And so this one is a standout one because it's the only one that had both of those traits, um, especially with the way these stripes work. It definitely reminds me of like some kind of fern uh, growing, I guess in this case, on the ocean floor. Um, and then this one is one of my favorites just because I like the way that uh, the larger shapes are sort of hugging all the smaller shapes. It's just a very pleasing arrangement to me. Uh, and then here, uh, as I described, you have all these points where uh, the larger shapes in the arrangement are near those points and the smaller shapes are far away from them. And I think in this one, what must have happened was the all of the points fell right in the middle of the canvas because you have this perfect circle that is built around them. And that was something that I didn't expect to happen because there are definitely some common arrangements for these mints to have, like a column or a sinusoid. But this was the only time I ever saw a perfect circle, even in all my tests. So that was really cool. Uh, and then when I was making this project, I didn't, I knew there's a lot of variety, but I didn't expect it to be the kind of thing where you would have mints come out that sort of remind you of something representational. But as soon as I saw this one uh, with this uh, cross up here, it immediately reminded me of a Christmas tree. And so uh, I got to share this one on Christmas and it was very exciting to me. That's awesome. And I'm curious to know, you know, how do you know when a project is complete? I, I can imagine that's kind of got to be like one of the more challenging things when creating, you know, generative art because every different, you know, change you make that could be like the final piece. But like, what is it in your mind that that says like, all right, this project is done. Is there something you look out for or, or how do you kind of come up with that conclusion? Uh, it's definitely hard. Like, I feel like I could have worked on Coquina for longer if I wanted to, like trying to come up with new ways of applying like extra flow fields and stuff. Um, I think it's when I, I generally know like what are all the parameters that I can experiment with changing. And uh, once I've tried all those, you usually get a good sense for which ones feel like they are like actually exploring new ideas and which ones would take the project too far in a different direction. So it's like once you're trying to change things and those changes make it look like a different project, that is generally for me when I feel like it's a good time to stop. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I, I would love to, you know, move on and, and talk a little bit about your second release called, is it Primordial? Is that yeah, your prim answer? Primordial, Primordial. Primordial. Yeah. Um, so that was released in May, 2022. And, and actually to maybe I'd love to actually just talk about uh, like, what was your experience releasing back in November of 2021 compared to, you know, May of 2022, it's gotta be, you know, just the, obviously we went through some crazy moments in, in our blocks, but I'm just curious, you know, what, how was your experience just overall releasing on, on the platform? Yeah. Uh, it's definitely very different. Um, there's a lot of things that change about the experience and it's hard. It can be hard to tell as an artist, which of those changes are due to like the market as a whole or the market specifically relating to art blocks or just the differences between the two works themselves. And so it's like uh, 
the number of coquinas that were minted is much higher than the number of primordials that have been minted so far. And definitely part of that is due to the fact that the market is in a different place than it was. Um, and I don't think that Primordial is a worse project. I actually think in some ways it's a much more interesting project. Like I was able to take everything I learned about Coquina and all the other experiments that I did between the two uh, and incorporate that into uh, what I think is a more thoughtful project. But at the same time, as I was making it, like I also had a sense that Coquina is a work that has like a really broad appeal. Like these are pleasing, bright shapes that are nice to look at. And I was doing something that's maybe a little more experimental with Primordial. And the aesthetic beauty was obviously a consideration when I was working on Primordial, but it was only one of the considerations. And so I was sort of aware that it might have a more niche audience. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually interested to know, like, what's how did you feel like minting Mint Zero for each of the projects? Like, is that a a fun moment or is that nerve wracking? I gotta imagine that's got to be like a mix of emotions. Yeah, uh, it is nerve wracking. Like, you want to have faith that at the point that you decide to stop, that your thing is done and it's in a good state. But there's always the sense that you could have some weird edge case that you had never considered and to have that be mint zero or even just to have a mint zero that's really interesting but is not representative of the project i feel like could be uh challenging as well uh but for coquina i was really happy to have one in the original palette that i have uh i can pull that yeah up. yeah Real quick. Uh, so we got a mint zero here. Yeah, so here's Coquina mint zero. And this is in the original palette that I came up with. And so I was really pleased to see that come out. Uh, it also has this cool effect where uh, it's something that's subtler in the project. Uh, different colors are more likely to be applied to different regions. And so you can sort of get all these nice stripes of color going through the mint. And so that one I was really happy with. And I was also really happy with uh, Primordial Zero, uh, even though it's very different. Um, we can get more into it, but part of the idea of having these triptychs uh, is that it gives the opportunity uh, or three images that could be really similar, or it could be really different. And I thought this one, like a really nice balance between those two. It's like each of these shapes is totally different, but at the same time, there's like motifs of these repeating uh, circles that show up in, across all three. And so I thought this was like really representative of the project. And I think that's the most important thing, or the thing that I most want out of a mid zero. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about, you know, Primordial. Can you talk to us, you know, just share the, the idea and concept behind this project? Yeah, so the idea is I have the same system where I generate an interesting set of points. And uh, in Coquina, when I was using that system, I sort of uh, rescale things to make sure that there's always like a certain fraction of the canvas that's covered in large shapes and a certain portion that's covered in small shapes. And so it's like once I generate that set of points, then it's fixed, but I do some tweaking to make sure that set of points always works. Um, with primordial, the idea is once I generate that set of points, uh, there's no guarantee that it's going to produce something appealing. And so the way primordial works is in the case that that does happen, I have like a set of criteria that the algorithm uh, goes through. And if it doesn't meet those criteria, it throws that output out essentially and replaces it with a new one. And so that's my new approach for this project to 
trying to harness like the power of this variation while at the same time making something that will always be appealing. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about that part where it basically selects something that's maybe more appealing. Is that so when you see the triptych and you know there's a piece that's re-rendering multiple times, is that essentially what it's doing right there? Yeah. So I pull up a different one where that happens more, maybe. Uh, like this one, we can see there's a couple shapes that are getting replaced here before it finally settles on this one. Here, this one's gonna get replaced. Um, and so in this example, those are shapes that uh, the criteria essentially boils down to do these shapes like take up enough of the screen, enough of the canvas, because usually when something is only in like one tiny corner, it means it's not gonna be an interesting arrangement. And so uh, that's the first test that these have to pass. But then because these are being presented in a triptych and you want something where you're looking at three distinct shapes, there are also tests for the second and third one that see whether they're too similar to the first one. And those tests are harder to run. There are ways that like the data used to generate these shapes where you can have two different sets of data that end up producing shapes that look quite similar. And so that was something that's very hard to account for. But for the most part, uh, I feel like it does a pretty good job of making sure that you get three shapes that are distinguishable from one another. That's awesome. And so, yeah, you have the ability to kind of curate your own triptych. Was that like more of a, a planned approach or kind of a late addition? Yeah. Uh, so I do think that the final image in each of these triptychs is important like that but also how you get there is an integral part of the piece. And so I wanted to make sure that once you've seen the final thing, because you have all these other shapes that are flashing by really quickly, I wanted to make sure that someone who's interested could go back and explore those different forms that weren't selected. So if you click on one of the forms, then you can go back and see uh, the previous one. And then if you continue clicking, you'll see this was the first form that was generated and then replaced. If you continue clicking, uh, you see a few forms that were never actually shown. So that's kind of a Easter egg that there were there are 10 extra shapes that they don't have to pass any sort of tests, but uh, sometimes you get some interesting ones here to dig through as well. And so this is sort of reminiscent of this one over here, but not quite the same. That's awesome. And and how did you land on a triptych? Was that something that uh, you know you always wanted uh, multiple pieces to kind of for you know collectors or yourself to kind of compare um, each piece individually with one another? Uh, yeah. So I think that was not something I was thinking about initially. Initially, I was just thinking, how can I uh, take these interesting forms and interpret them in a aesthetically interesting way. Uh, but sort of in the process of trying to think about what these shapes are, like I knew uh, these were things that I enjoyed looking at and they sort of remind me of some kind of like alien organism or something, but it still found it hard to look at it and sort of know exactly how I'm supposed to feel about it. And I think a lot of that, a lot of understanding just the gender of algorithm in general is not just looking at one output, but comparing it to other outputs and knowing like what is the space of possible outputs that this work could produce. And so that's when I came up with the idea of presenting them in a triptych. And also uh, the way that I generate each of these forms uh, gave me the opportunity to explore like how closely related uh, these shapes can be. So it's like, I have these three sets of rules essentially for how these forms are generated. And the way I make the triptych is for the second and third image, I only change one of those rules. So two thirds of like the DNA of each of these shapes is the same. And so even though uh, every triptych shares two thirds of the same DNA, sometimes you'll get like exactly the same form, just different like shading 
whereas other times we get three totally different things. And so it's sort of just trying to represent how much variation there can be uh, in like a generative work. Like it, it's when you're do, working with emergent systems like these, it's really hard to understand like what it's capable of. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, based on the style of this project, is it possible by any means to, to pen plot any of these mints or is it more of a, like, it, there's obviously very like fine and distinct lines. So I'm curious to know if that's even like a possibility or not. Yeah, I don't have a plotter, but I think that because all of the drawing that I'm doing on the canvas is just a bunch of lines, then it would be possible. Um, I think if you wanted to capture the colors accurately, that might be the hardest part. Yeah. There's, there's 27 layers in each of these. And so trying to find 27 different colors, some of which are very subtly different, could be challenging. But yeah, if someone who has a pen platter is interested in trying, I'd love to work with them to see if that's possible. And that's awesome. also for printing, uh, I do think it would be cool if these were printed or plotted, I guess, as a set of uh, three individual images instead of like one large image. And so you can press on the number keys to save each of these images individually, if that's something you're interested in doing. Yeah, so is it, what is it you do? You hit like one to save, you know, mint number one out of this triptych and then two for the second, thir three for third. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. And, and yeah, let's talk a little bit about the colors on this one. You know, as you mentioned, it'd probably be challenging to plot using the colors that you've kind of created, but, you know, how does this compare, you know, com co compared to, you know, Coquina as far as, you know, the color palettes and selecting them? Were there, was there any possibility of, I know it might be challenging, but to kind of like pair them together by any means or, or not? Uh, it's certainly possible. The, it's not something I think you can count on. Like it might be for specific mints, uh, but the palettes in Primordial are completely generative. Uh, I don't have any fixed set of palettes. And the idea behind that is just that I'm working with these shapes that have so much variation and I have very little control over them. And it felt weird for me to sort of exert my artistic influence over them in that way by just having like a set uh, number of palettes to choose from. So instead I was able to find that working with colors in like a certain saturation range and certain brightness uh, tended to look really like at least solid on like a black background. And then having just a single background color uh, really made the project more cohesive when there's so many other things that can look different between outputs. So uh, sometimes you get some really striking colors, but in general, I think they all look pretty nice. And uh, there's also an interesting effect where like, if you look really closely at any one mint, uh, there are colors, there's like a lot of different colors going on here, but then when you zoom out and sort of take it in a whole, as a whole, uh, certain ones tend to dominate, like how you think about it. It's like for this mint, I think of this as being like primarily a pink and blue mint, but there's basically the whole rainbow in here. Like you have orange and green and uh, some other colors going on. And I think that's like an interesting effect of our perception that you sort of tend to boil down what you see. Uh, it's only when you look really closely that these other colors start to pop out. Yeah, it's interesting when, sometimes when you like zoom in, you know, when you're minting, I mean, zooming in on like the second piece, for instance, it kind of reminded me of almost like a, a brain scan where you kind of look in and then it's kind of like the the colors and, and the shapes. So I think it's such a, yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful project. And I, I love like the, you know, all the differences that you kind of see, like the middle one actually, it kind of looks like a, like a, um, a snake kind of like opening its mouth. Oh, like a cobra. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a cobra. But 
yeah, I think you just said you executed the colors really, really well. And it's just been great to see, you know, the mints coming through and are, are there without talking about, you know, the rarity, do you have any, you know, favorites, like early favorites so far from this project? Yeah. So I pulled up, this is one of my favorites. I think the ones that uh, appeal to me the most are the ones that at first glance, you wouldn't think of these images as being related, but like something about the algorithm put them together. And so I think this is one of my favorites with these different ways of looking at these curved shapes. Um, this one here is one of my favorites because each of these three forms has so many different things in common. Like they all have kind of this hourglass shape and they all have uh, sort of the color is focused around the two ends of it. And they also have sort of like these little wings coming off, but they're also each distinct. Like this one only has two wings and this one is not quite as bulbous. And it's like, here's three shapes that are different, but they have so much in common. And if you ask me to put together an algorithm to make like this specific kind of shape, I would not know where to start. Like, I don't know what it is uh, that I did that produced these shapes. Like I could not recreate this by hand. And so that's really the kind of thing that I find really exciting about this project and just about generative art in general that I can, I know how every piece of this code works but it can still make things that surprise me. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, I'm excited to obviously see more of these mints come out of the Minter. And just so everyone knows, this project is still available on the Artblock site. Um, I think it's such a beautiful project. Is there anything else you want to add about uh, Primordial? Uh, I had one more that I pulled up just as another example of one that I liked. And I've lost track of it here. Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it for what I wanted to say about this. OK, great. And now moving on, I'm curious to know, are there any techniques or processes that you're hoping to learn and, and use in the future? And, and if so, like why? Mm -hmm. So I definitely want to dive more into shaders. I feel pretty good about using fragment shaders, but I know nothing about vertex shaders. And I just think it gives you a much more powerful tool for making animated work because I definitely want my work to be as polished as possible. And so it's like, if I can hit 60 frames per second consistently, I wanna do that for something animated. Um, and so I have more learning to do there. And then also all my work so far has been in P5.js. I'm definitely planning for the future and learning some other packages. Uh, 3.js is one that stands out to me as sort of opening up a new set of possibilities for working in 3D instead of 2D. Awesome. And, and you know, what do you do in your spare time? It sounds like, you know, you obviously, this is like your full-time job, you know, to kind of work and create art, but is there anything you do outside of, you know, creating um, projects for fun? Yeah. Uh, so on the weekends, uh, I like to do a lot of hiking. Uh, my wife and I drive up to New Hampshire to the White Mountains a lot to hike there. Uh, and just getting outdoors, I do a lot of bird watching as well. Uh, just making sure I get out of the house when I'm sitting in front of the computer most of the day is important. But I do also watch a lot of movies and play games and stuff. Is there any uh, bird specifically that you really enjoyed kind of seeing out in the wild? That's something actually I've kind of, you know, noticed. I just moved recently and, you know, I've just been picking up on all the birds in the area. But yeah, is there anything that you're hoping to see or some bird that is in the area that you kind of enjoy? I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, right now it's spring. So there's lots of uh, ducks and geese that have all their babies falling around at the pond that we visit. Um, and then I think one of the fun things is you just don't know what you're going to see. Like you can never plan on seeing like an uncommon bird, but when you do, like, it's really exciting. Like we saw 
uh, an Oriole the other day. It's not too common around here, but it's cool seeing something with such bright colors in nature that you don't usually get to see. Definitely. And, and does that kind of inspire some of your work as far as, you know, the colors or kind of the maybe the movement of, you know, the birds? Is, is that influence you by any means? Yeah, I don't know about uh, birds specifically, but definitely things that occur in nature in general is uh, something that I want to capture. I think there's something interesting about using code, which is like a very... Uh, or can be a very rigid and structured uh, system, like a set of well-defined rules to try to create something that's more organic and free-flowing, like the things that you see in nature. There's like an interesting uh, juxtaposition there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And do, are, are there, do you have any other projects or maybe exhibits that you're planning for the remainder of the year? Or are you kind of focusing on on something specific or, or yeah, what are you kind of working on right now? Yeah, so my thoughts after working for five months on Primordial is I want to uh, work on some smaller things with a quicker turnaround time. Uh, so I do have something maybe I can share, like some previews of the next thing I'm working on. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, this, is a, this is a project that I'm working on, it's sort of like a pop art inspired take on um, flow fields. Uh, but of course I'd use my same system for generating interesting points. To, so instead of just one flow field, it's like a whole collection of flow fields. And so here are some examples. Uh, yeah, awesome. It, thanks. It feels like it is something that is close to finish, but uh, I definitely have, I only have one palette right now, so I have to do more work on that front. Uh, and then, uh, there are some small tweaks that I need to make as well. But that one is close to done. And that I probably will release like a smaller run of that somewhere other than Artbox, because I would like to leave Primordial open until, because I feel like that has a lot more variety that's left to do. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Is that something you would release on you know, OpenSea or a different platform? Uh, Maybe FX hash. I haven't really FX seen hash, work cool. there, but it feels like uh, there's a different audience there that I would love to connect with. Yeah, absolutely. That's very cool. And you know, for people that are aspiring artists, people that are you know tuning in that might be interested to pursue generative art, do you have any you know resources like websites, books, or essays that you kind of recommend to those people? Yeah, one website I really like is. Uh, this GitHub here, uh, pull it up. Uh, so it's github.com slash Jason Webb morphogenesis resources. Um, and it's basically a whole set of different models for uh, lifelike systems. And this is something that I come back to either when I'm looking for inspiration, like maybe this is a cool starting place for an algorithm. And then I will try to put like my own tweaks on it. And also just for learning about uh, new coding techniques, I think it could be a really cool place. Cool. Yeah, we'll definitely have to share those inside of the, the show notes for this episode. And I'm curious to know, you know, obviously, Mental health, I feel like, is such an important part of the space. I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's being talked about as much as I would love to. But you know, how do you wind down once a project is you know complete, or you know, once you're done, you know, processing or you know, coding a project? Do you do anything in the spare time? I, I know you mentioned hiking, but is, do you do anything else to kind of like wind down and kind of like decompress? Yeah, just making sure, like, I do something out of the house. I feel like. For me, the most stressful time is leading up to the release of a project because that's the time when it's still in your control. Like you could change, theoretically change things if you wanted to. Uh, once it's out there, I sort of let it do its own thing for a while. Um, but yeah, I think just making sure you have like other hobbies and stuff that you can invest some time into to take your mind off 
uh, of work is always a useful thing. Cool. And and how can people reach you? Should they have any questions, like if, website or social media plugs? Yeah. So I now have a new website, which is jacobgold.art. And it has some info about each of my projects and also how you can get in touch with me if you want. And also I'm on Twitter as Jacob Gold Art. Uh, and on Instagram as well. I find Twitter tends to be a better place for uh, reaching out to people in the NFT space. Awesome. Well, Jacob, thank you so much for being on At The Denimants. I really appreciate you being here. It's been uh, just great. You're learning about your projects and you know, seeing some, you know, uh, some potential mints from a future project. Looking forward to that one being released as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to talk with you. Awesome. Uh, on next week's pre-recorded After Dinner Mint show, which will be released on June the 15th, we have a generative artist, Matto. So that'll be uh, in, in the next few uh, weeks. Uh, we have a Twitter Spaces discussion called Mincers and Makers. That's a weekly show with three to five artists, collectors, and other, but other notable community members with conversations surrounding art. Uh, our next show is on June the 9th, starting at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, those three artists will be EDG, Def Beef, and Aaron Penne. Uh, you can tune into that conversation via the Artblocks Twitter handle, which is at Artblocks underscore IO. Uh, those discussions are all recorded and available in a podcast format, which is available on platforms such as Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, speaking of podcasts, all of our After Dinner Mint shows, including this one, will also be turned into a podcast. Uh, those will also be available on major platforms such as Apple, Spotify, and Google. Uh, finally, we have a newsletter that gets delivered once a week with information on upcoming drops and generative, a generative art related news. You can find a link to the newsletter in the description of this YouTube video. Thanks again to Jacob Gold for joining me on After Dinner Mints. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, for everyone that's tuning in, make sure uh, you comment, like, and subscribe to the Art Plugs YouTube channel. Be kind to each other. Buy what you love, and we will see you all next week. Thanks, Jacob. Appreciate you. Thanks. Thanks.